So um, this subject um, was inspired by uh, a board member of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. For years, he's been saying a near-death experience and a not near-death experience, transcendent experience are the same. And I was going, no, they're not. And he'd say, yes, there is. So two years ago, and there he is. I shall not name him. <laughs> insists there's no difference. I decided to examine my belief that there is a difference. But we have to go back in the Wayback Machine um, to where my interest started. By the way, I feel like a dragon with a tail up here. We'll get this out of the way. Um, I'm originally from Kansas, which directionally is there. It's that part you can't see, because there's nothing there. Nonetheless, um, there I was, May 25th, 1970, 11 o'clock AM, at the Shawnee Mission, Kansas Department of Motor Vehicles, actually getting my first auto license, um, getting my first of one of four cars to this day. I, I get attached to things and don't let them go, obviously. But that's another story. Um, so I was in perfect health. I was with my dad. The last thing that I remember is um, turning to my dad and saying that I was feeling funny and needed to sit down. And he said to me, there aren't any chairs. So what I'm going to tell you first is my dad's memory of this experience, and then I'll tell you what mine is, because they're different. Um, but according to my dad, I, my, well, ironically, I had a number, and my number came up, which was my first hint that God, the God that I call God, that thing that loves us all, God, um, was a real joke meister, because, you know, welcome to Irony City. So my number came up. I appropriately signed all the papers. We were leaving the building. I collapsed into and through my dad's arms out onto the sidewalk. There happened to be a uniformed nurse passing. Um, she, of course, trotted over. Uh, St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri was called, but also the Shawnee Mission Department. Uh, so the Shawnee Mission uh, Volunteer Fire Department. They arrived first. They had something um, brand new, new packaging, according to my dad. It was a portable ventilator that had two features. One to um, pump air appropriately into the body, and the other was a vacuum mode to suck object, objects out of the uh, airway that were blocking the giving of air. So that's why, as children, we're not supposed to run with candy. Um, it's also called a cafe coronary if you're eating and lettuce gets stuck and, and it leads to uh, cardiac slash respiratory arrest. Well, anyway, so this was this great gizmo. According to my dad, new packaging, ripped it off, applied it because I wasn't breathing. Um, and it was on vacuum mode, so whatever oxygen was left in my body got sucked out. And uh, again, according to my father, around uh, where the apparatus was, uh, my mouth got like black. Um, and the tips of my fingers got black, and, and he doesn't remember anything else. That's fine. They started pumping air in. That didn't work so well because enough of my lungs had come in contact with themselves. Sticky little devils, aren't they, doctor? Anyway, it's, it, you know, you have to, uh, once, once uh, lung membranes come in contact with each other, they're usually separated under an ICU or CCU condition where they're slowly and steadily expanded. Well, this was a blast of air that had to go somewhere. It didn't entirely get to my lungs, didn't entirely get to my brain either. Um, what I did was inflate, like a, a really bad human balloon. Epithelial emphysema, for those who care. Uh, things were a mess. The uh, volunteer firefighters, and to this day, no one, at least in the United States, other than a physician can pronounce death, but they turned to my dad and said, we're really sorry. I'm married to uh, a paramedic. I know that's paramedic talk for, you know, she's a goner. And um, then a man came uh, that my dad 
always called the Good Samaritan, became from the back of this growing crowd. Now this is a Saturday afternoon in a boring community. So pretty much what happened is that people got on the phone, I guess, and said, you got to come down to the DMV. There's a dead girl on the sidewalk. So according to my father, later, after he processed it sort of, many years later, he said, upon reflection, it was street theater on a Kansas weekend. I mean, it was just entertaining. People were excited. It's why we all slow down at car accidents. We're morbid critters. So there were a lot of people. And there was someone, um, a man, a strong man, who came from the back. And he said just plucked people out of his path and, and plucked the firefighters off of my body. And he was swearing a blue streak. And now we know he is from Colorado because I've been here for a few days and I've heard it. In Colorado, you hike, you ski, you own a dog, and you swear. Am I right? In the back row, got it. So um, then he did what we now know as citizen CPR. He finally gave up, turned to my dad and said, I'm not getting a blank, blank thing. My dad's memory collapses at this point. Um, Next thing he remembered, the ambulance from St. Luke's had come. The body was thrown in the back of the vehicle. He jumped in. We all went to the hospital somewhere in there in what turned out to be uh, uh, an hour and a half, not of not breathing, but of ongoing interventions, emergency interventions before I was completely stable. Um, I don't want to give away the end of the story. And I would love for you to eventually buy After the Light, but she lived. But shh. So, uh, yeah, so that's his story. And his problem, it was traumatic. Here's what I remember. Um, and because this is specifically about out of body experiences, I'm just going to mainly pound on that part. But I remember a woman's voice to my left saying, I'm not getting a pulse, I'm not getting a pulse. And I turned to her, and with the same reality with which I am now speaking to y'all, I said, of course you're getting a pulse, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking. And she ignored me, so this felt like it went on for a while. I, I didn't understand it, and then for lack of a better way to explain it, I, I felt like I just got into like a near-death snit. You know, I just thought, you know, away with you then. But she didn't go anywhere, I seemed to, and I next found myself in a, a gray environment. I had emotion and cognition. I was aware that I was warm. Hell, not being lakes of burning fire, but Kansas in winter. Or in this case, Colorado. I don't know, between September and July, I'm not sure, but you know, not a cold weather person. So I remember thinking I was warm. I also uh, had a sense that I was waiting for something with assurance. Um, I could play with this gray matter. I could see that it was actually uh, made up of globs of, I used to call them little bottomless pits, mixed up with glints of brilliant light. I knew I wasn't alone. It didn't distract me, though. And then in the midst of this gray material came um, a light. It emerged underneath me. It spread out in all directions. It was brighter than, than this. I mean, it was, it, was in, it, was, it was so bright. It didn't hurt my eyes such as it was. I was seeing just fine. And this light, which I call God, or my creator, uh, whatever, fill in the blank, it doesn't, my love actually works the best for me because that's all it was. It was just made up of love that I don't think I could have received in flesh. I think I would have just not been able to, I don't know, in any human way experience it. Um, ah, it, it was, indescribable. And it spread out in all directions. Um, and at the same time was layering back on myself. I'm always in search of metaphors. And I, I'm stumped on this. Uh, and 
what's been 40 years and I'm kind of blah blah still about it. Uh, I, have, I have no words to describe the intensity of the love, the, how the love was personal and how the love actually communicated. Not in English or Espanol or any other, or Latin. I took Latin and, and uh, Spanish in high school. By the way, my high school sweethearts in the back row and probably never would have guessed that all these years later we'd be in Denver. Yeah, talking about you. <laughs> Hi. Can you believe it's me up here? Hi. Yeah, we went steady and then I barfed on his ring. I was like kind of, the, yeah, remember that? So, uh, I'm sorry, that's a life review issue. Uh, where am I? The light. <laughs> So I was able to communicate with the light in what felt better than, than what I'm doing now, obviously. Um, it was a combination of math and music. I do not have skills in either. Um, I won't even suggest that you ask me to sing, but I am asked to lip sync in church during the hymn, so that should tell you something. And um, math, forget about it. I, as anyone knows who knows me, I hand the restaurant bills to other people and ask them to figure out the tip. I'm like not there. So um, what the heck with math and music? Well then, I, I do have a metaphor and it's in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The mothership has come down. There's a scientist on a big keyboard. Remember this is the mid 70s. And there are these giant cables that go to a computer that's the size of a trailer. And the mothership is communicating in music. The scientist on the keyboard is hitting the notes on the keyboard, feeding into the computer who's coming back in math. And math was something that these scientists could understand. In fact, that's how they found the location of Devil's Tower. And I saw that movie and I thought, you know, who is Steven Spielberg? And is he here, by the way? Checking? But who is he? I mean, I thought, how, who, how, who knew about this? And, and so that did it for me. And then uh, now brain is being mapped. We all read, and so I'm sure you've read about that. As it turns out, that part of the brain which discerns math and music is the same. And child development wise, and I was a child development major at Kansas State University, um, it was the common wisdom of that time, and now we know why, that teach your children or grandchildren introduce them, expose them to music before the age of 10 because the window's wide open for math skills and it closes around the age of 10. Math skills and music become more challenging. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. So I, now that computer science is catching up a bit with the brain, I really think we're just downloading stuff all the time. I don't know how to explain it, but I, I think our, our brain and our mind, which probably are separate, are getting all of this and we're, we're just not able to comprehend it yet. I believe all that we need to know is we really already know even because my sense as I ask questions of the light, to the light, um, weren't like I was learning anything, it was like I was remembering. So I'd ask a question and the answer, you know, like what is life? There's a good one. Um, you know, why are we born? That's what I asked. Why are we born? And the answer came back and it was like, oh yeah, that's why. That's why. You don't like me blue? <laughs> um, and so, um, well, the answer to that was we banged on the door to be born. I mean, the answers are so simple, you know, the questions seem profound upon reflection, but they really weren't. It was, it was just so... Uh, but it was so perfect. And I was with the most, again, love. And, and so this question and answer thing, there was no time. So it just was going on and on. Um, but then I was told I had to go back. And I fussed over that and said, uh, no. And anyone would, except for you. And uh, the answer was yes. And I said no. And it was like a volleyball tournament. Yes, no, and I'm here to tell you, you can argue with God. 
God's going to win, but argue away, good luck. So I was sent back. And um, I have a number of weaknesses. Math is one, music is one, and linear space is one. I cannot parallel park. Still can't. If I can get my car within three feet of the curb, keys are out of the ignition and I'm gone. So I have this incredibly profound experience. I'm sent back, and, I've, and here's the out of body part. And this is the part I want to launch from in the rest of the lecture, really. I found myself on my back looking at the physical body, and that was not me in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely not me. The me that was me, that was thinking, that was feeling, that was in awe of everything, was not. Um, those eyes were closed. That chest wasn't inspiring and exhaling. Um, I, it, there wasn't an attachment that really mattered to me. It wasn't scary. The only thing I could think of was, I can't even park myself, because actually I was about three feet from my body. And um, it just, you know, don't drive with me. It, it you know, life or death, I'm lame -o. when it comes to um, parking things, I guess. So uh, there I was, um, mildly interested in my profile, only because, um, I don't know, had nothing else to really catch my attention. I didn't care, though. I did not care. Then I saw a man bend over, and as soon as his mouth touched the lips, I seemed to get up, and the me that is me. And by the way, I own that. I felt like Kim. I wasn't this disembodied, nameless thing floating around. I was Kim, and Kim, got up and seemed to be able to like go through feet and, and legs, that was my sense of it, and hover over this man's body and then go through his body and into the physical body. And um, going through him, I was able to know him. And later I thought, and I mean really know him, like emotionally, I, on every level. Um, and I, I, I know now that the physical contact, yes, helped me get back into my body, but what really drew me, why I got up and decided to go through him, I guess, and back in my body, was that he loved me. And as I went through him, I sensed that love. It was the love of compassion. You know, love comes in all kinds of flavors and degrees, but it was love. I had just been with the greatest love of all. So of course, I was gonna recognize it elsewhere and gravitate towards it. So now, I'm back in the body and it's not good news. My consciousness was in my body, but not in my brain, so to speak. Everything was dark and cold. I was miserable. I felt like I was, and again, lots of cognition and lots of fear. Um, I felt like I was running around in, in this body. And um, by the way, I pulled my medical records in, in writing after the light because I didn't want a journalist to do it and surprise me. So I got them and uh, remarkable medical records because it, they do speak of my death, but because of the snafu with a ventilator. And I read snafu and thought, you know, they killed me. Anyway, so um, but my body temperature was 86. Well, that would be in keeping with, really, corpse. I was cold. Again, hour and a half went by. My body temperature was so darn low. But my consciousness felt like I was in a long, dark hallway trying to reach a woman's voice that kept calling my name. And I, it was very compelling. But it was as if the hallway was blocked by dank, moldering, European tapestries or something. You know, I just didn't, I just didn't have the strength to push through. I always thought that that was a nurse or something in the emergency room, and it was only about 11 or 12 years ago I brought it up with my dad, and he said, no, funniest thing, everyone attending you was male, which he thought was really odd back then. So the respiratory therapists, of course, the firefighters, the physician, and the nurses in that particular um, ER suite were all men. Never found out what female voice was calling me, whatever. Um, yes. Hi, Jody. Hi, Jody. 
Good question. May I answer that? In the middle, I'm in a, a place where I was dead and it's really hard to pull out right now. I'm in a mood. Thank you. Good question. Uh, and I'll repeat the question uh, for the mic. But um, I was really scared. It was a, it was a nasty place. And, and in my head I thought, you know, too much Edgar Allan Poe. You know, too many late night black and white TV programs. We had Gregory Graves in Kansas City. You know, you scare the pants off of me. It was really, really scary stuff. And so I did what anyone would do. I begged for God again you know, to come back. And um, what a whiner I am. I mean, my recollection is that I was really irritating. You know, please, no, please. And um, good old God came back, not in the form of the light, but uh, this math and music business. And basically the message was, you know, a riot already. And a window-like thing opened to my right, and there was heaven. Um, at least my heaven. Um, it was beautiful, long grass that went out into softly rolling hills, and there was a, a fence that surrounded it. The only little problem was that they weren't earthly colors as we know it. Uh, the intensity wasn't of this earth. However, the blue of the sky I found in the last few days, and I found it, I'm going to get all choked up here, guys. I found it in Independence Pass in Colorado. And um, it was the second time in two years I have been gifted with an experience as close to my near-death experience as I can imagine. Independence Pass is yonder on the way to and from Aspen and Snowmass. And, and up there, the, the blue of the sky was, um, it was my heaven. I, I know what to say. It was so beautiful. And so was um, being with, in Niagara Falls, and there's someone I'm looking at right now who took me uh, in upstate New York um, after a lecture there, and, and we went behind the falls, and the power of the water coming down behind the falls, they had to pull me away. The place was going to close down. The poor Bennetts couldn't get me out of there. Like, I'm back in my, my God. Or I, and so I find that nature is the best for my soul, I find my, my experiential metaphors um, on earth, even though these are heavenly experiences. Not real professional, is it? So um, anyway, so I, you know, I was given a choice right then and there. And it was, um, to my mind, cold, moldering, fearful death, heaven. <laughs> cold, moldering, fearful death, heaven. I was well on my way to kicking off this mic. No, I was like almost the way through that window. There was no question about it. Then I was like you. I was gone, not coming back. And then um, God, being a smart ass, said, wait, just a darn minute there, basically, and got my attention, and I was this close, I was this close to going home for good. Not that I don't love my life, but that's why, Jody, I said I'm in this moment. I, I can't think about other things when I talk about my near-death experience because it's just um, a, a space to be in that's sacred and wonderful and, and the memories are warm and fuzzy. And um, so I turned, and in a series of like flashes, you know, the old uh, flash bulbs where you had to the, screw them and pop them out, it was like flashes. I saw first um, a place, and I called it where mountains met water. It was in Kansas. And, um, and then there were flashes of people, and just everyday kind of captions, which I could read, you know, but best friend, next door neighbor, colleague, so on and so forth. Um, and it meant nothing to me. I didn't know any of those people. I felt no attachment to that whatsoever. I'm still planning to exit stage right. And then came a flash, and I saw myself being of service. Now, I'll tell you something about the way I was raised. It was without concern for how much money was spent. 
uh, very materialistic upbringing. That daddy that was by my side at the DMV um, was the senior partner of the law firm that to this day represents all the tobacco companies in the United States and Canada. So he was the original insider. But a good man who quit smoking in the 70s when the lawyers found out cigarettes were bad, they just didn't tell the public at that time. But nonetheless, that was my money. So my joke was, think a pony, get a pony, because that's what I did. You know, whatever I wanted materially was mine. And we had service. We had someone, um, you know, uh, like a nanny. They're called a nanny now, but someone who came in and took care of us. And uh, someone who cleaned the house and someone who took care of the yard. And, and uh, you know, people were hired to make things run in our household. I was used to two kinds of service. Sterling. <laughs> and that which served me. What I wasn't accustomed to at all was giving service, and this last image was an image of me giving service. And I swear, I just thought something like, cool, and I was back. I had made a choice. This was a problem, though, because uh, it, it took a bit to, I had a lot of, um, uh, pulmonary problems, go figure. So it took a while to recover, but recover I did. Uh, they're all respiratory problems. I obviously got enough oxygen to my brain during the resuscitations and, and all of the interventions, but I'd like to think I was far smarter and I lost IQ points in the process, except for the high school buddy in the back row who knows that <laughs> I'm it didn't make a difference to my IQ. I was dumber than stump then, and I'm just probably not any smarter now. But um, it, it didn't matter. Nothing mattered to me anymore. I just knew that this body, this brain, this lifestyle, this everything was over. I didn't know what plan B was, but it was over. Now, I will answer the, qu the question was, in that state of being out of body, do I think that I could have read something on the ceiling? Not a chance. No way, Jose. I was interested in what was going on down here on my physical self, speaking for myself. However, I believe that that which interests us, interests us, attracts us. I'm going to tell you a story about a shoe on a ledge, which was interesting to that person. Um, one of our Seattle peoples, a Boeing engineer, came out of body at work, and what attracted him up high were engineering instruments. There could have been um, any number of things going on around, but if they weren't meaningful, um, I don't believe it's going to attract our attention. So I'm not sure if that uh, research design will ever work. To answer your question that's unspoken. So uh, now I'm uh, way back in the body. I don't know what this body means. It feels very small. And let me tell you, I have since decided as a mom, having watched cartoons over and over and over again when our kids were younger, I have seen now Disney's Aladdin so many times that I finally got the message. And I realized on the umpteenth viewing of this cartoon, that um, I had a metaphor for what it's like to be out of body. So I'm going to share it with you. This is, for those of you who haven't been there, exactly what it's like. In the, in the movie, Aladdin, Aladdin asks the genie, what's it like to be a genie? And the genie says, what's it like to be a genie? All the powers of the universe itty bitty living space. That's what it's like to be out of the bottle and then scooshed back in. I felt way bigger than my physical body. And now I feel like I'm in a bottle court and I've never gotten over that. I, I feel bigger spiritually than I am physically and it's a cramped existence. Kansas was a cramped existence. I wanted to find where mountains met water. So, um, I bought a, a Volkswagen Squareback. Um, I had a hamster by the name of Toto in a birdcage strapped in. 
off we went, and then came uh, another, you know, God's a jokester. When I left, my mom was just visiting us in Seattle last week, and she calls my leaving the day I ran away. And she still talks about it all these years later. And so I'm going to quote her now, because that's what she just said a week and a half ago. The day that Kimmy ran away was blah, 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 blah. So I do remember something of a speed bump backing out. But let me tell you, it was also a stick. And I didn't know how to drive a stick. I found seconds. So I'm lurching my way to wherever, you know, about to hit I-70. And um, Toto's got eyeballs bigger than its little body because I'm, you know, just not, it's a gear grinding experience as I lurch along towards my destiny. And I began to get scared and cry and did what Oprah calls the ugly cry, which involves lots of mucus. And um, I, I started to talk to God again. I got the big rescue once, why not a second time? So I started, you know, calling out to God, I don't want to change, you know, because I, I, I hated change at that time. And um, so we're lurching along, and Toto's about to go out of body himself, and he's like, I don't want to change, I don't want to change. And we got to what was then a toll space on I-70. I'd already figured that mountains were west. So I was going to go I-70 west, and I'm approaching, you know, and lurching towards this toll booth, whining again about, I don't want to change. And then there was this big sign that said, change needed. Well, <laughs> it was like, okay, get off with you. It was ridiculous. But that's when I thought, I'm not alone. Well, we fast forward. So I'm now out of Kansas. In Hayes, Kansas, got a tornado, had to take cover. So Toto and I are now in a tornado. And then skipping over Denver, where I stopped, and Berthoud Pass, where I stopped, all in search of mountains and water, Salt Lake City, Lake Tahoe, and San Francisco, and then finally Seattle. I was running out of space in America. Uh, I wound up in Seattle, Washington, which then, as now, is called the Emerald City. So I am Dorothy. And my hotel mate knows how many red shoes I pack. Or shoes in general, right? <laughs> so. Um, all of this led to then, from then on, honestly, living on the automatic door opener of the grocery store, every place I needed to be. Not like, you know, I haven't had cancer, lost a, a baby boy during birth, uh, have a daughter right now in the Marine Corps in Afghanistan, uh, have my youngest beloved, I'm too attached to her daughter, leaving the nest after graduating from college. Uh, shout out to someone in the audience I'm looking at, who was her dance professor, uh, who is here. Um, you know, we all, it's life, we all have our ups and downs, but my life has been so blessed by things like the back of Niagara Falls, a great husband, terrific kids, um, independence past, good friends, good old friends, good new friends, love, 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 it all is so wonderful, until uh, this whole thing about an out-of-body experience is the same as a near-death experience and stuff. So I'm, I'm jumping now to... Um, the PowerPoint, and we can take that off. Um, so I began to, uh, because of, of conversations within the IONS community, think about this stuff. And my metaphor for the difference between a near-death experience out-of-body situation and a, gee, we're in perfect health, but out-of-body situation is this. It's like you leave your house in the morning, and you know, the couch is there and the furniture is there, everything's the same. In an out-of-body experience, to me, in health, you come back to your house and the furniture is where you left it. You're back in your good old familiar house. In a near-death experience, in my experience, you leave your house and you come back and it's total Alice in Wonderland. You know, the dining room table is on the ceiling and the couch, is, everything's all messed up. It's not the same as it was before. You can't navigate through your house any longer because you're bumping into the furniture that wasn't there when you left it. Much more confusing. I know this because since then I have been out of body in health. I've also been immersed in the light in health. So I want to say absolutely and positively, in my opinion, the light is the same no matter what. I have no research to prove that. It's just I know the light is love 
it's God, it's whatever. It doesn't matter if you're breathing or not. It's there, it's here now. It's everywhere, it never leaves us, ever. It's always the same. What I believe is different is the out of body experience, that perception of leaving one's body and staying in this you know, earthly plane. The first time that happened, um, it was really interesting. I found myself in a completely unfamiliar home. Um, the sun was starting to come up, so, and, but it was the middle of the night in Seattle. I had no idea where I was. I got really panicky because I felt invasive, but not so invasive that I wasn't nosy, so I poked around until I saw sleeping people, and then that really scared me. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if they wake up and I'm in their house, and uh, invisible or no? And so I panicked and a series like lights appeared here and I pressed one of them and went back into my body and landed hard. And I don't know about anyone else who's had an out about experience, but every time I do, I crash land. I'm still not parking myself, it physically hurts. So, um, but that was in health. And by the way, many years later, I was visiting a friend in Virginia and the first time I entered her house, that was the house. But she didn't live there then. She bought the house from a doctor and Mrs. Raymond Moody. Isn't that interesting? So, um, oh, give me some tequila and I'll tell you more stories about that. Anyway, life is crazy like that, you know, synchronistic. So anyway, um, I put this together, this, this part of the lecture, then the PowerPoint for a conference at the University of Washington, um, August of 2009, and um, this is, these are my conclusions based on me. <laughs> I mean, I got, I got no academic research, even though I know how to do academic research. This is just life stuff. My own life experience is that, as well as those of my patients, and people who attend Seattle IONS and people I meet at IONS conferences and people I happen to sit next to on airplanes, whatever. This is just a collection of stories and stuff. So, well, there's me. I'm proud of being an MSW. I'm actually proud of having a license. I worked hard for all that stuff. Those of you who have progressed academic, academically know that um, it's hard work and I'm proud of it. I've done the work. These are the only publications on this subject in all of existence. I haven't read them. I don't like to read other people's work because I don't want to be accused of ripping them off. I have really strong feelings about people who start telling other people's stories without their permission or knowledge and then even worse, messing it up. So I have skimmed these articles, but as you can see, they're basically by the same two people. And it was, um, half of them were a long time ago and half of them were still a long time ago. So I hope to add to that series of publications because this lecture will be submitted for publication in one of two journals. Oh, hint, Jan Holden. All right, at this point, if you don't know what a near-death experience is, you have been drinking tequila. But every near-death experience obviously is an out-of-body experience, so no brainer there. Um, but every out-of-body experience is not near-death. Okay, I'm a reductionist thinker. Uh, I can even reduce this definition. Uh, NDE, like an out-of-body experience, involves the ability to comprehend, comprehend one's surroundings without benefit of our body's physical operating system. Uh, more reductionist viewpoint would be it's just a memory or collection of memories that occur when we die. However, I do believe there are big differences between the two. And these are my observations and life experiences. Okay, I didn't read Life After Life. I, I can't tell you how many people have said that in the last few days I've been here. That book really did change things, didn't it? 
But um, I was so, uh, I, I, the book hadn't come out in 1970. I needed to make something of this mess. So what I'm sharing, I have dibbies on because I thought I invented it. You know, I, I thought, oh, these are, my, these are my organized thoughts about it, except I called it When I Died. Uh, they weren't as extensive as anyone else's, but here's what, based on the experience I shared with you, when that woman was saying, you know, I'm not getting a pulse, not getting a pulse, even though she was rather irritating, I felt a great amount of peace. One person who uh, had a bicycle accident that came to Seattle Irons described it, in my opinion, the best. She said her sense of peace and well-being was so great, it was like having dinner in a fine restaurant and getting to a point where you just cannot eat another bite and pushing away from the table. You're just so complete and so done and so filled up and feel so good. Uber Thanksgiving. And then, of course, my own experience of being able to um, hear but not communicate, I really did feel like I was yakking at this nurse. I didn't know she was a nurse, but it was as real as me talking to you right now, as I've said before. Um, there are sounds and sights that don't have anything to do with Earth. What I saw in my heaven was not an earthbound place. Uh, there aren't colors or intensities like that, except at Independence Pass. So now I have to kind of adjust this part of this lecture. Uh, the sounds, there are sounds. Um, they're really beautiful. Uh, someone at the University of Florida th almost 30 years ago gave out samples of beautiful music to near-death experiencers and, uh, you know, as part of a research project, beautiful music, into ears were thumbs down on all of it. None of it was as beautiful as what I call the sounds of the universe or angelic chorus. Um, an architect in Seattle, after his near-death experience, has property on Bainbridge Island on the north end. He built a two and a half story wind harp, thinking that as the wind came down from Canada through the Straits of Juan de Fuca, from the north, it would hit the strings of the harp and make beautiful music and duplicate something that he heard in his near-death experience and except no. And the harp is still there, available by boat, but he, it was for him a failure. It wasn't as beautiful as the sounds that he heard in his NDE. There's a void or a tunnel, uh, not always pleasant. For me, it was unpleasant. Um, the tunnel, I have not heard of a tunnel without a light at the end. The light is bright, but doesn't hurt one's eyes. It's not a squinty kind of light. Uh, I used to say that you go through the tunnel forward, and then, of course, hand in the audience who said, I went through backwards. So it was, thank you, lady. I have to mention you now in every speech I give. She went through backwards, my kind of gal. She probably couldn't parallel park either. And, um, and then I used to say that you go through alone, but then uh, my co-founder of Seattle Ions, Betty Preston, went through with animals, specifically animals loved by people. She was not animal oriented before then, but she was with horses and birdies and fishies. Scared me at that point. You know how many dime store goldfish I've killed? <laughs> and I'm gonna have to greet them and explain that flushing. Um, but she said there were animals loved by people in PS. Um, Boy, visiting Betty afterwards was, you know, wearing a hip boot thing because she had an extension of a zoo in her home afterwards. She was so animal oriented. Um, then, uh, so you can be in the tunnel with others or uh, that we love and they can be four footed or winged or finned. Um, Another common element, not me. I didn't have any deceased loved ones. All of my grandparents were alive, all of my cousins and parents and whatever. I had no one to grieve me but God, uh, darn. But uh, lots and lots of people meet loved ones or spiritual beings. There is that light. Um, I didn't have a life review. What could I have reviewed? Throwing up on your ID bracelet. I mean, it wasn't a big, you know, I, didn't have, I was young. I didn't have anything to exactly review and ponder. So I didn't have a life review, but I did have a life preview. And I didn't know it was unusual, but now, and by the way, that life preview, where Mountains Mount Water was Seattle, I have thrived there. Um, I have been of service completely since then. 
and joyfully uh, and exhaustively and I've met all but one person of those flash forwards. It's trippy to meet someone years later after a life preview in a near-death experience. The first person I met was under the caption of best friend. I met her on a sailboat, Lake Union, Seattle, Washington. I saw her and became a stalker. It was, you know, you're my best friend. And I've said this before, she wanted me as a best friend as much as she wanted a second menstrual cycle a month. It was not happening. And I was undaunted. I was, but you're my best friend. But you're my best friend. And if she were here, where she's still my best friend, talked to her last night on the phone, she would say, I wore her down. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go to jail. Anyway, so it's been very trippy to meet people. The next door neighbor was Alice Jones, on and on and on. Um, there are frightening situations within the near-death experience. Um, not negative. Um, I told the president of our fine organization last night how much, how negative I feel about the word negative in my experience. I have tear stains permanently on my neck from people who have had scary experiences. They're already battered down. And then they get around people who go, oh, it was wonderful, and I saw my deceased mother, and this light, and oh, it was just great. So it's like they're hanging on a lifeboat, and then a professional comes along and says, that's a negative experience. And they let go of the lifeboat, and they sink. I'm begging you to not use that term ever again. It's why yesterday I shouted out so rudely from the back of a dear friend's lecture. So um, frightening situations do happen. Uh, a uh, physician uh, and researcher, now deceased by the name of Barbara Romler, uh, studied the research done um, by the mid-90s of other researchers. And 14% of my research at that time were frightening experiences. So I'm sticking with that, 14%. I think it could be more, I think it could be less. Uh, it's my go-to point, however. I believe that there are four phases of a near-death experience. Again, I have dibbies on this information. I made it up, <laughs> but I believe it's true. One is disassociation from the body, duh, we can't hang on. As I age, why would I? If you had my bladder, you would not hang on. I would not be tempted any longer at my age to uh, do anything that I saw in a life preview. It's, you know, as we get older, we're designed to expire. Uh, like a really good library book, but yet, um, you know, leaving the body ain't a bad thing at the end of our lives. Um, there is a perception of the natural world. We can see things, and I would like to share with you the story of Maria and the shoe, because I wound up at University of Washington Teaching Hospital, Harborview Medical Center. If you've ever been in a teaching hospital, you know if there's a cardiac arrest, the thundering herds arrive, they do the resuscitation. Uh, Harborview Medical Center is a trauma center that still serves one-fourth of the United States. People from Alaska are airlifted in, from Montana, from Oregon, from Idaho, yada yada. People are flatlining all over the place. But one of them um, came out of her body and among other things saw a shoe in the remote on a remote ledge. And I went to get the shoe. I want to set a record state, straight in a best-selling book. I'm described as climbing out of the window and crawling on my hands and knees to the ledge and then turning and crawling this way. OK, this is April 1977. I'm telling you, mini skirts and formularies. They were this thick. As if, I mean, for one, I am a professional. I would not do that. I was, you know, way above the ground. I mean, why would I do that? So you read about that, it's not true. It's simply not true. It was dramatic enough that there was a shoe on the ledge. I just picked it up, you know, so who knew? Well, it's now what I call the shoe herd around the world. But for me, it, I thought it was just for me and Maria, this patient. Uh, I was there to validate the experience, and she was there to validate my experience, because until then, now I'm a social worker. I self-diagnose myself as a very high-functioning schizophrenic. I am not sure to this day that diagnosis is wrong, but in this case, it wiped out that 
sane bit, you know, am I really sane or keeping a well-kept secret? Because when I saw the shoe, I lost my balance and I bumped my head against the glass and I remember it was a watershed moment. I remember saying out loud, this happened to me and, and just for a moment seeing the breath, moisture on the glass and it disappearing. But then, you know, don't draw I picked up the shoe. We all pretty much worship the shoe at Harborview. Um, since then, there have been skeptics who say the story doesn't exist. I uh, have been in the presence of someone in Houston, Texas at an IONS conference who came from Britain and didn't know I existed and said, oh, where do I get back and tell everyone there really is a Kimberly Clark Sharp? And I thought, good grief, I'm wearing a dang nang tab. I mean, if that doesn't do it. So the shoe happened. I have published a rebuttal in the Journal of Near Death Studies, uh, grinding under my heel the people that would care to redefine my life. The shoe is in our garage somewhere. Many of you have been to our home. We have a 900 square foot garage that looks like the end of Indiana Jones. When their heart, you know, the Ark of the Covenant goes into this cavernous, you know, come on down and find the shoe. In my office is a film made by a Philadelphia Film Company when I still knew where the shoe was. And so it's, you know, besides which, darn it, I'm not a liar. I had the shoe. Maria's not a liar. She saw the shoe. End of story. But it's a good story. So perceptions of the natural world happen. And then, of course, of a supernatural world. I think we've covered that. And then we return to the body. I have never interviewed anyone that has not returned to their body. <laughs> I want to set the record straight on that, too. And I don't want to. All right. Here are the differences in my opinion. Whoa, this comes with sound. In the near-death experience, we're at death's door. In an out-of-body experience, can I stop saying in a non-life-threatening situation? Because I'm running out of time. So in an out-of-body experience, you can be perfectly healthy. You can be relaxing. You could be meditating. You could be under emotional stress. Grief is a good one. By the way, and labor and delivery, and any long-term running. Oh my goodness, all of the marathon runners that have come to our door. Um, oh my, uh, you know, ski accidents. Any place where there's activity, Colorado, Washington State, other places, there's gonna be, I think, a, an uptick of near-death experiences. Um, but at the same time, there are people that have emotional stress or, um, or maybe, well, let's go to the next point, you know, or nothing. There's a walk into this experience and they're out of their body. It, it doesn't have to be life-threatening at all. Uh, the sense of threat in a near-death experience, only in frightening near-death experiences. There is no sense of threat whatsoever that I've ever heard in a near-death experience. In an out-of-body experience, it depends. People who spontaneously pop out of their body sometimes report to me that they were really scared because they didn't know where they were. One fellow was in the Boston Marathon, <coughs> found himself running above the treetops. He didn't stop running. His body was in ventricular fibrillation on the ground, but our hero kept going. And then at one point, it was like, uh-oh. And he got scared, and then oh, he's back. Um, he was a great athlete, a great athlete. I'm thinking of someone we know who was also a bicyclist in the Mexico City Olympics. His name was Tom Sawyer. has a good book. Find it. Um, there are instances of scary encounters. There are things that go bump in the night. We're back to that tequila. Be happy to have a shot and tell you some stories. We'll build a campfire. We can stay up all night here. There are scary things that happen. Hellish, demonic, loneliness, darkness, in both instances. People find themselves sometimes a little out of range of their comfort zone. Spontaneity. In the near-death experience, they're always spontaneous. Even 
people who would think that they're trying to take their own lives aren't expecting a near-death experience. I'm, I'm willing to say all NDEs are spontaneous. In an out-of-body experience, some people plot them through meditation or perceptions or through substances. Um, alcohol, not so much. Drugs, right on. Oops. <laughs> Perception of time in an outer body experience, there's often an awareness of time. Tick, 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 I was gone for 20 minutes. In a near-death experience, forget about it. Time absolutely does not exist, period. Gone. No way to describe it, but it's not there whatsoever. Perceptions of space in an outer body experience often includes linear space. I moved around the room. When I was um, out of body in Virginia, I was moving from room to room. I, I was in motion as if I were in body. Another time I was out of body, I was actually driving my car. Not safe, but it worked out in the end. But um, I, I still felt like I had moved my car forward, or it had moved forward without me. And we had gone from the street to the curb, where you know it was a little safer to not be attached. In a near-death experience, uh-uh, no sense of earthly space whatsoever that I've heard ever. Even when people go from point A to point B, it's not like I moved about 20 feet at, during their, during their near-death experience. I might measure it afterwards, but not during it. And, and then off the earthly plane, uh-uh, none of that. Sense of connection to the body? Yes, people out of body still feel a connection. They often describe a cord. I've only heard it in two colors. I've seen it once and it was golden. Oh, well, in my case. And there's still a sense of strong sense of self and a plan to come back to the body. In a near-death experience, there's no connection. Uh, it's over. It's the body. I mean, there's no, like I said, the Kim that was Kim was not in that body. No ego. Those who know me know that after near-death experience, big ego. <laughs> God loves me more than anyone else. Uh, but within the experience, none. It's gone. It's, it's not there at all. Environmental elements, usually out of body, we only perceive earthly environments. In a near-death experience, there are both worldly and otherworldly environments. And twice I've heard of a place with coral sand and a green sun, and it sounds beautiful, and I say we find it and have a vacay. But that's just my opinion. Visual distractions in an out-of-body experience, well, there's no presence of deceased loved ones. And in a near-death experience, that's the big hook. That's the irresistible urge to go forward or to go back. It's loved ones. And you're often, what I've heard, is distracted by earthly things. Like, oh my gosh, there's that necklace I lost. Distractions, distractions, distractions or not, I love the sound, but as I said, in, within a near-death experience, it's just you know, mom or dad or brother or sister or child that provide the distractions, or Jesus or God or whatever, and unearthly sounds and environments. Integration for an out-of-body experience, no big deal. I personally have not had to counsel anyone rattled by an out-of-body experience to the point of needing um, a social worker. It's very unlikely that there are emotional or spiritual problems unless it was so spontaneous like that runner who was on the top of the trees and it freaks them out. And intervention in my social work experience is not necessary. In my experience with the near-death experience, ay ay ay, on all these levels, lots and lots and lots of challenges Integration of the NDE, as we know, I hope we know by now, can be way delayed without an opportunity to integrate. Lifestyle changes, out of body, nada. 
you know, I never knew of anyone who went out of body and then came back and divorced their husband or quit drinking or whatever. It's like life pretty much goes on the same. After near-death experience, everything changes. Everything. Everything. Perceptions, values, on and on. It's over, and there it all is. I mean, just you, you name it, it's, it feels like it's going to change. Fear of death, well, zero, out of body, business as usual. This is the last slide. Extremely high needs. Extremely high. That's why we need validation after a near-death experience. I find, in my experience, in the ears to be fragile. I also think there are limited resources. I know I'm right, because IONS is the only resource. It's now, there are other resources blooming. Assist is one. The Enderf website is helpful. But mainly, it's not so many. But with out-of-body experiences, there are fewer needs, much fewer needs. Uh, people don't seem to be more or less fragile than they ever were. And there are a myriad of resources here and elsewhere. So that's all I got. I would love to hear your opinion. We're out of time. I'm not really going to go anywhere right away. I know there are exceptions to the rule. I'm going to be developing this not any further, so get over it. Thank you for your time. Um, for knowing me and, and helping me over my nervousness, for enduring a PowerPoint and my going over time. I love you and God bless you all. Thank you.